Uh, I must say that I feel a bit, I feel a bit like the odd birds out here, uh, because most people here, you know, you're a computer scientist, most people here, and I actually study birds. Um, more precisely, I use birds to study the meeting point between behavior, ecology, and evolution. It's a field that some of you may know as behavioral ecology. And the kind of question we ask in behavioral ecology is, you know, well, how behavior maximizes the winning fitness? Or what I'm more interested in is you know, how behavior, behavioral mechanisms evolve in order to support behavior that maximizes the winning fitness. So the kind of why question that we are asking is eventually why this eventually helped to do survival and reproduction of the animal. Now, but you may ask yourself, you know, how your help point is related to all this and how come that we're working together. And why, uh, and why yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it's increased our survival or uh, reproduction. Um, but my hypothesis is that, you know, Joe likes uh, puzzles and paradoxes. And when you present to him a, a good challenging question, he cannot resist the temptation to solve it. And some of the problems that we have been working on related to computation, evolution, and the brain. And they're really difficult. And almost, I can say, that 20 years after we started, we are still running pretty much like Achilles and the tortoise. We are getting closer and closer every year, but we are not quite there yet. Um, but we will get to this very soon. Uh, I have mentioned actually to say that in my background, I also like paradoxes. And uh, you know, early in my career, uh, I studied something that people might call the cuckoo paradox. And the paradox, very briefly, is that if you look at this meat warbler, this female, uh, this female is really clever because she can spot the cuckoo egg in the nest and she can recognize that it's not one of her own and to reject it from the nest. But the same female with the same brain, with the same cognitive mechanism, if for some reason she failed to, re re to recognize the cuckoo egg and the cuckoo chick hatched, then she behaved like a complete skipper, like she'd take care of this chick, she'd feed it, and she, although this is really a big chick and much different than her own offspring, uh, she, can, she, she will continue to take care of it. So we have the paradox of how the same brain with the same mechanism, how they can be so sophisticated in, to, in, in relation to the more difficult task of telling diff, small differences between eggs, and actually the perceptually very easy task of cuckoo chick, uh, they fail to recognize it. And they actually, they, they, they pay the price of raising the cuckoo chick instead of the raw chick. So from evolutionary point of view, it's a big paradox because we say, well, if they have already the genetic makeup that allowed them to reject egg, why they cannot ever, why the first mutant that start to use it for rejecting chick has not spread in the population. So natural selection to promote it very quickly. Now, but you can get some insight about it when you think about the learning mechanism, the mechanism that allowed them to recognize their eggs. So for example, what we know from experiments is the way they learn to recognize the eggs is kind of an imprinting-like process. So first time they breed, they look at their eggs and they learn this is my egg. And next time, if they will see an egg that is different than what they, what they know, then they will reject it out of the nest. Now this mechanism worked in generally very well, but it involves some risk. Because you can imagine that if we involve a female in the first time in their life that they lay eggs, they have cuckoo egg in the clutch, they can have the cost of missing printing, which means they learn that this one is mine and also mine, my egg are mine. So next time they will accept the cuckoo as one of their egg type and they will not be able to be clever. But in most of the cases, you have to remember that cuckoo parasitism is about you know, five, 10% of the cases. So in most cases, even if they were missing printed in the first brood, okay, they can still raise in most cases, they will not be parasitized and they learn that their own egg is belong to them, and they will have a successful family in the future. Now, if you ask the question, okay, why the same mechanism of imprinting-like process can be applied for the case of chick recognition, then you realize that actually, while learning to recognize eggs is adaptive, okay, learning to recognize nestling is maladaptive for cuckoo host. And you can show it by a really simple model that I managed to publish almost, it's now 30 years ago, and the idea is quite simple. The difference between the two cases is that when a cuckoo chick hatch, they have this amazing instinct to push everything from the nest out. And they remain, they kick out all the eggs of the host from the nest, and they remain alone. So in this case, if you try to implement the same learning mechanism for the case of nesting recognition, a female that in the first time they are parasitized with a cuckoo, they will learn that only a cuckoo chick is their own. And in the future, they have the risk of rejecting all their offspring in the future. So the cost of misprinting is much, much higher. And when you do the calculation of the probability, you actually show that in this case, 
even if there was a Newton that tried to apply this strategy, okay, it will be selected against. It will not be promoted by natural selection. And this may explain why evolution did not promote this, uh, this situation. So um, the conclusion maybe here from, you know, the brief conclusion from this logical exercise is that you have to consider the ecological context of learning mechanism and the risk of learning the wrong things versus the right thing. Now, let's now go to another paradox, and this is more related to the kind of thing that I've been playing around with Joe for many years. And this is something that actually many people don't even view it as a paradox because we so much used to the fact that this is the way the brain works. And I call it the poor memory paradox, okay? It's true that the brain can remember many things remarkably well, but there are certain things, actually very basic things, that as, as we already mentioned, for example, Moshe Vardy's telephone number, it's very difficult to remember. But here, for example, if you get a new credit card number, okay, you have to rehearse many times. Some people don't even bother to try to learn to memorize it. You know, we need but shopping. The second go. Yeah, maybe. Uh, we need a shopping list because we cannot even remember the list. You know, the, the, we need to take a list for shopping because it's very difficult for us to remember the, the shopping list, right? Uh, for simple calculation like this, you know, kids really hate it at school, okay? They have to really write down and follow everything. And the reason I see, I think it is a paradox if you think about it, that from a computational point of view, all these things are really simple. Any small pocket calculator can do it. You know, just you give input to computer, they remember it. So as evolutionary biologists, for me, it's kind of why during all this time of evolution, why you cannot have, you know, a better memory? Why the system did not evolve to be, you know, to make it easier and make it, to make it more kind of precise. Actually, we know there is evidence for genetic irritability in various types of memory, both in humans and in animals, which means that you have some individual in population that the memory capability is better. Working memory, for example, it is known that they're better than others. And if it was so important to have a better memory, why during evolution we don't, we don't become better? So some of you may say, maybe we are, you know, so the idea is that memory, better memory can evolve. Like if you have data about genetic irritability of memory, it means that if you have variants and natural selection favor it, then it should improve. Some of you might say, okay, maybe it is in the process of improving, but if we, we have to wait, you know, a few more generations or maybe a thousand generations, and then we will have better memory. But we have good reason to believe that this is not the case because I don't know if you know, there are many nice studies about working memory in chimpanzees, for example, and it seems that some animals have really, in terms of, that, in terms of this very simple memory that even, monkeys and apes have quite reasonably good memory. So it seemed that there was enough time for evolution to actually to improve our memory. The alternative is that memory limitations are actually adaptive. That the reason we don't have a better type of memory in these cases is that actually there is something good about forgetting or not allowing the memory to be so quickly. Uh, I see you, David, I will not escape the question. I just want to make sure that this is okay. Um, and uh, actually we're asking, it's like, very different questions, a different level of question that you discuss. You don't discuss the mechanism, we ask why the mechanism evolved the way they are. And, um, and so the direction is that maybe if you again, you think about the biological brain, not about computers, that is very easy for them to do, and you think about the ecological context of learning mechanism, then maybe under some circumstances you can think that we should build the machine in a way that memory, you know, remembering will be difficult in, the, in such cases. And actually, when Joe and I start working and we have this kind of theory about how the brain might work and how cognition, cognition evolve, one of the implications of this model was really that memory limitations are adaptive. We suggested that this would be one aspect of the model, like one outcome of the model, that actually memory limitations are adaptive and they are really uh, important. Uh, during the years, we managed to <clears throat> publish a few, a few papers that describe some aspect of this thing that we've been working on, mostly with Shimon Edelman from the Department of Psychology here at Cornell, and Owen Colodny, my former student, who is now at the Hebrew University. And some of these uh, papers actually did, did, did their attempt to uh, implement some of the ideas in computer simulation. I'll mention some of it briefly later on. But before I continue, maybe, you know, when I talk about the model for cognitive evolution, I want to make clear what, what do we mean by a model for cognitive evolution? And some people, when I tell them a model for cognitive evolution, they think more about the historical perspective uh, that, you know, maybe you have an evolutionary tree and you say that maybe, you know, language evolved somewhere here after we split between 
humans an ape and imitation evolved somewhere here. So just to make clear, this is not what we are talking about. It's not the historical perspective. And this is the way, it's not something that really explained me the evolution of the brain. The model for cognitive evolution is something that will try to answer on the question how small genetic modifications make a better brain. Okay, how something that, uh, how we can really resolve the magic of, of how you can start with really simple learning mechanism and get to something very complicated and do the fantastic thing with the brain. Now it is true, you know, I I've been teaching evolution for many years, but I can say that although we explain many complicated, uh, evolution of many complex traits, in terms of the brain, it's not really simple to explain its evolution. It's true that we know that it's evolved gradually from, you know, in, in, in size and complexity, but we don't really, it's not easy to explain, okay, if you add tissue, if you add size to the brain, how it really makes it more clever. Uh, so people say, okay, it's about the wiring and the connectivity, but even here, it's not that we know what really we have to tune or to do, to, to modify in order to create a better or more clever brain. The, the answer is, I mean, the, the really reason that it's really difficult is that in order to answer this question, question you really need a model for the brain. It's, uh, I would say it's very intuitively. You cannot really think how you can improve a machine unless you know how it works. Okay, if you want to improve your vacuum cleaner, you have to give it to an engineer, he will probably ask you, well, let me see how it works and then I will see if I can improve it. So in order actually to think about the, the, the evolution of the brain, you have to, to come with some model of the brain. Now, of course, this is extremely ambitious uh, exercise because, you know, if I tell you that, you know, I'm going to present you a model of the brain and this is what Joe and I are doing, come on, we are not neurobiologists even, so nobody will take it seriously. But we still say that uh, in terms of developing a theory, you can build or should try to build kind of a toy model of the brain or a model of a model. It might not be even the right model, okay, the correct model, but something that will push other people to develop so we can start thinking about it. And, to give you an idea of what I mean in this kind of model, I, I, I asked this question about another organ that now we understand better, and this is how small genetic modification make better eye. I don't know if you know, but in the early days of evolutionary biology, it was very, it was known to be as a very challenging question because it was not clear to people how you can start with a very primitive eye that have some pigment cell and nerve cell and can only tell you whether there is light or dark. How evolution can take it from this primitive eye to the very complex eye that we see now in vertebrates or in octopus. You know, what, what is the, you know, how small mutation can, can make this magic. But when you understand how the eye really works and how camera really works, then suddenly you have some workable hypothesis. Uh, what now we know that it's enough that you start bending. Okay, if you bend this uh, layer of pigment and then when it's bent, you have these cells, they report of light from above and this light from this direction and from the left and the right. And gradually, if you just modify every time this curvature into a nice ball, then you get a pinhole camera, basically any, any light reflect on a certain a different area. And at the moment you realize this process, okay, it's not a magic. I can see how small modification of mutation and selection can gradually form kind of this complex eye that we know. So, but do we have something similar for the brain? Of course, this is not a complete model of the eye. The eye is extremely complex. So let's go back and ask, you know, how small genetic modification, you know, can make a better brain? And very briefly, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, just to sketch it, uh, our framework to think about it is to start with kind of, we have some learning algorithms, but the learning algorithms themselves, they construct some network that represent the statistical relationship between items and objects in the environment. For example, in this kind, this kind, this network may facilitate, I mean, animals will be able to navigate the way to food or away from predators by having this statistical representation of the environment. This network is a theoretical network. It's not a neural net. We're not talking the nodes and links in this network are not necessarily uh, and neuron cells or synapses. But there are, the idea is, here is that it is based on simple processes that if I keep working in them, I can make them complicated gradually without a magic, without any kind of try to do it without any logical gaps. So I can start with very simple learning algorithm that construct the network. Of course, this net network has to be hosted by real tissues in the brain, but it's not that the brain, you know, mutation in size or the anatomical structure of the brain, they are promoted only to the extent that they support the structure of the network that was actually built by, by these learning algorithms. 
Now, when you think about this kind of network, you very quickly you realize that the big issue is the issue of chunking or segmentation, or if you want to call it configure learning or binding, it, is, it has many names. Okay, but what is the problem of chunking? If you want to represent the environment, you know, you can ask, okay, why this unit of the network? Why 22? Why 375? There are many ways by which you can segment streams of data. It's like in language acquisition, you can parse syllables to words in different ways, okay? So the same way you have to chunk or segment words in the stream of, of input in, in language, this is true for visual data. And I think that it's known for many, um, many problems in general that this chunking is is, is, is problematic or at least is challenging. There are many ways to solve it. I mean, in the, the AI literature, there are many ways to solve it, but we suggest that the way the biological brain solve it is actually by limiting the memory, but actually it's, it's by having a fine tuning of memory weight parameter of increase and decrease. And actually the decision whether to chunk, for example, the unit 375, like all the 375 to make the one chunk is if they, observe again and again and again and again enough memory weight before they decay. So if it's only one time you observe it, it will soon decay. But if it will observe again and again and again, it reach some memory threshold and this fixation. And if you ask, okay, why you need three times? Exactly, these are the parameters. This, what we suggest is that at the fine tuning of the chunking process may be the major target of selection during cognitive evolution. Because this is what really determine what chunks you have in the system. And the chunks that you have in the network really determine the shape of the structure of the network and the shape of the structure of the network determine what you can do with the network, how you can make decisions, how you can navigate your way and so on and so on. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we, we play with this uh, theory and in some component of it really implemented with, together with Shimon uh, Edelman and Owen Kolodny, actually without Joe, but it was inspired by the stuff that I did with, uh, together with Joe. And we implemented for the case of animals foraging in structural environment and for learning language acquisition. Actually, we did a nice model that performed quite nicely, at least at the level that was acceptable in, back in 2015. And we discussed, you know, uh, we used this model to solve some problem in animal creativity and uh, problem solving and to discuss gene culture, co-evolution, and in evolution of cognition in general. Uh, the most res recent version of this story is a paper that Joe and I uh, just uploaded to BioArchive. And this is the most updated version of the theory. I would say it's more like it's, a, it's almost a manifest, like we try to put everything that we have because we realize that we have some missing parts in the theory. Uh, I will not try even to describe with this uh, paper, although this is the one that we are most excited about. It's really a working paper, the problem uh, it's, it's almost 60 pages long. And, uh, but instead of telling you about this paper, I will do something else. I will just try to answer this question about how small genetic modification make a better brain based on a simple story about a little fish. And this is a story about the cleaner fish and the cleaner market problem. Okay, I was told about this uh, problem uh, from uh, Don Sherry, he's a world expert on cleaner fish mutualism and on fish behavior in general. And he, when he told me about this, uh, I knew about cleaner fish because they're famous. But when he told me what kind of problem they solve, and it's a very difficult problem, and sometimes even kids or apes find it really difficult to solve. And, but some of them are doing remarkably, remarkably well, but some of them are not good at all. So he said that I have some stupid cleaner and clever cleaner and so on. And when he described it to me and he thought about genes for you know, cognitive ability and so on. And when I start reading and looking at his result, I told him, you know what? I've been working with this with computer scientist, Joe Alperin. We have a whole theory. I think that exactly what you have here is all about chunky. And let's try, and I suggested him, let's take yourself part as a good theoretician. If you get to the postdoc fellowship, we can try to model it together. And this is how we start, you know, uh, a year ago, we published this paper, which is kind of a theoretical paper to try to model the story of the cleaner fish, uh, but, but really completely inspired by, by, by this fine tuning of uh, the need to fine tuning the chunking process. And I'll try to describe this uh, very briefly. What is the story of cleaner fish? I don't know how much you know. Cleaner fish are, you know, there are little fish that live in coral reefs all over the world, in Australia, in the Latin, many other places. When you have coral reefs, you have cleaner fish. And they make a living from removing ectoparasites from other uh, fish in the reef. Almost all uh, fish in the reef are coming to get, uh, to get service from them. Okay, and they, sometimes they are waiting lines and the cleaner fish can remove the ectoparasite. Uh, they can have sometimes thousands of interactions per day. So they have to make repeated decision uh, what to do to, to cooperate, to, uh, uh, to, to cheat, to clean. And 
which client to sell first. Now the market problem, the specific story about the market problem or the framework of the waters is as follows. Uh, some of the fish in the reef, we call them residents. They have usually smaller territories and they're stuck in one place. They cannot free, they're not free to go because other fish will chase them away. Okay, so they are residents. Some other, when they come to the cleaning station of the cleaner, okay, they can go to other places as well because either they have a large territory or they are, or they are not territorial. So when clear fish face two kind of clients, okay, and they have to choose between a resident and a visitor, uh, if they go to the resident first, the visitor may not wait and will go to another cleaner, okay? So they get only a reward of one. Let's move, they remove parasite and for the simplicity of the model, let's, move, let's assume that the reward is always one, okay? But if on the other hand, the cleaner go to the visitor first, Okay, the resident has nowhere to go, so it waits, and then the cleaner can go to the resident, and overall, you get another one, and then the reward, the reward they get is two. So the simple solution for the market problem is, you know, the solution is that, you know, when facing R and V, choose V, the ephemeral first. It seems very simple, but it's not so simple. First, as I mentioned empirically, it means that it seems that this problem is not easily solved by many animals, including apes, including even little children. And you have to remember that uh, you don't know in advance who is a visitor, who is a resident. They, you have to learn based on the behavior. You know, the one that's going away, they are the visitor. And let me show you uh, very briefly that the, the problem here is that first, I'm going to show that chunking is needed. You need to use the process of chunking. And second, that just having the ability to create chunks is not enough, but chunking must be adjusted to ecological condition. And why this is the case, sorry. Uh, if you just use simple learning models like simple reinforcement learning, you can update the value of each of them separately of the visitor and the resident, okay, but each of them will be equal one. So you cannot really learn to prefer the visitor over the residents, okay? You need somehow to perceive that they are related. They, that this first decision is as consequences for the second one. So the second possible model is extended credit or what the psychologists call it chaining. chaining. And this is the idea that you, uh, assign the credit for the second fish to the first choice. So if you go to the V and then you get one and then you continue to R and get one, you actually assign the credit uh, for both meals uh, to the first choice to go into V. So then V will be equal to. Okay, if this is, if you face only these pairs of client and your resident visitor, this learning model seem to go well. But in nature, actually, you have many times that you have two residents or two visitors. If you have two residents, you go to the first residence, the other resident is waiting, okay? And you learn that actually going to the resident give you two. And if you go, so, okay, so this uh, uh, extended credit model teach you that uh, R is equal to, and when you have two visitors, okay, anyway, the other visitor is likely to leave you. So you learn that actually going to the visitor is equal one. So now when you average all this possibility, actually this V equal one dilutes the V equal two, and R equal two actually tell you that actually R is good. And when you really run the simulation and it's really intuitive, you cannot learn this way. It's not good enough. What you really need is to have a complete separate representation of each pair combination. And each pair combination is a different, associated with different uh, payoff, which is very similar to what we do chunking in language, okay? You, for example, you don't mix car in carpet or car in cargo, okay? The syllables get the meaning only from the combination, from the context within the, the configuration, okay, within the chunk. So you can show that if, if they have a representation, if they have chunks, okay, they can solve the problem. But the question, okay, is how, how they really create chunks and how to make decisions about building chunks, okay? Uh, here we start building a very simple version of kind of network model. And this is uh, this is when they, they don't have chunking. So they have a representation of visitor and a resident. Each of them are associated with the probability of getting food. They have an empty arena, which means they will not get food, but maybe if they wait, they will get another visitor or a resident, then they will get food. But in this case, they, when they see resident and visitor, they perceive them as two independent events and they cannot really learn. What you need is to add to this network representation a node that uh, represent the sequence V and then R. But so if you have this representation, then if you see this pair, you can match this vision of the both of them with the memory experience of V then R, and then maybe use it to choose the food. But the question is you know, how you create a chunk. And the simple rule we use, again, you can see more details in the paper, is that you, have, you create chunk when V followed by R more than expected by chance. How much more? 
Well, this is, depends on the chunking parameter. It means you can imagine there is some tendency to create chunks. Some fish can create them very quickly for every deviation above chunks. Some of them may require much more uh, observation above chunks level to conclude that they have to create a chunk. Actually, this chunking parameter, uh, parameter is a simplification of what is more biologically more realistic that a memory weight increase and decrease parameter that I mentioned before. Okay, but you can just capture them in one parameter. But the idea is that uh, there is some tendency to associate the, the two components that they are and V together. And if they come again and again and again, you create the chunk. Now, this chunking parameter, as I promised to show you, is really, really important because you have to adjust the chunking parameter to ecological condition. Otherwise, you may fail to solve the problem. And why this is the case, why it's not enough to build chunks? Because before I mentioned to you that if the cleaner approach the resident, then there is a risk that the visitor will leave. But sometimes there are a lot, many clients, and another visitor will come. Okay, it's not happened very, very often, but it does happen sometimes. And then the cleaner learned that, okay, after resident, you can go to serve a visitor. And then R followed by V is equal to, so then they can learn what we call the chunk RV. They can learn the chunk RV, and the chunk RV is kind of misleading because actually they, they, train, they teach you to prefer the, the R uh, as well as the V, so it just prevent the, the possibility to solve the problem. So in other words, there is a trade-off between under-chunking and over-chunking. On the one hand, you might say, to, in order to solve the market problem, we want to learn to chunk as fast as possible. But if you learn too fast, okay, you also learn the misleading chunks that happen rarely, okay, but then you don't. So you want to be in between the line. Now, you can really simulate uh, the, whole, uh, the whole process, and you can show that actually you have different optimal parameter of CP, of chunking parameter, for different client density and different relative uh, frequency of uh, visitor and residents. And for example, if you take uh, and oh, okay, and, and of course, for each uh, optimal CP, you have some different consequences in terms of visitor preference, like your ability to solve the market problem. If, for example, we will take the the medium area and in, uh, in between, so you have a, a medium client density and an equal proportion of uh, visitor and residents. Then you can see the chunk cre uh, creation frequency. Like most of the chunks are the correct chunks, and very few of the wrong chunks are are being created over lots of simulation. And as a result, really, they learn to prefer the visitor and to solve the problem. If, on the other hand, uh, you live in very high level of client density, okay, then despite the fact that the optimal CP will be very high, so you try to delay learning of chunking, okay, uh, many of the wrong chunks will be learned because they still happen very quickly, and they fail really the blue color means that they really the, the preference, the visitor preference is, is low, and they fail to solve the problem. In this particular case, you might say, well, they don't need to be clever because they have a lot of client fish, but you can show it in a different uh, range of the situation. Uh, finally, if I want to just conclude, you can plot all these number of optimal CP against the frequency of encountering R and V pairs, and really to see that uh, here, when actually the frequency of encountering R V pair is, is relatively low, then low CP is better because it allows to learn the helpful VR chunk faster, but the risk of learning the misleading RV chunk is still low. On the other end, when the client density is high and then you can meet all these pairs more frequently, then high CP is better to avoid overchunking, but may not be enough. All these uh, dark uh, black dots imply cases in which, despite setting the threshold uh, appropriately, like optimally, they fail to solve the problem, to learn correctly and to solve the problem. Um, what is nice about it for empiricists, when you think about it, many people usually take, you know, take animals from the field and take them to the lab and test them under standard condition. Uh, this really explains that actually you expect that if you make a standard test, and the way we test them in the lab is if you give them like color plate, one color, for example, red will be the visitor, like if they don't go, go to this plate first, you remove it, and the one is waiting all the time, and uh, then they learn to solve it or not solve it. But actually, you can predict that if you take uh, cleaner fish from different uh, habitats and you test them in a standard lab test, some of them, although they have some optimal parameters, some of them may solve the problem and some not. So in other words, you can say that even optimal cleaners are expected to fail the test if the CP is tuned to different ecological conditions. Um, so kind of conclusion you can take is that the essence of cleverness, at least for the cleaner fish, okay, is their ability to fine tuning of chunking to the distribution of data input in the environment. 
Now, all this story about the cleaner fish, it's a story about two types of chunks in a simple problem with very clear fitness consequences because, you know, they need the food, okay? But try to imagine how, you know, if you take it back to the much more complicated uh, chunking problem of building much more complicated uh, network in the brain. And uh, then, you know, we believe that uh, this fine tuning is also really relevant for cognitive evolution in general. And a lot of these things are discussed in the stuff that we are working um, on. Thank you for your attention. I'll take some questions. First question. I mean, you can ask a question, but why don't we evolve to remember better? Why do we evolve to jump higher, to run faster? You know, I mean, I can look at any. Yeah, this is absolutely legitimate question. Yeah. Yeah. But the answer is, all cases must be the cost, right? Well, but the question is, what is the cost, and what? When you, but you can use this question as a tool for research. I mean, when we ask, uh, when I teach behavioral ecology, we say that. We don't ask why question just to prove that everything is adaptive. What we use as a working hypothesis to, to really understand better things. Because every time when you have a paradox and you ask, then you might get an interesting answer. So it is, it's true to ask why don't you run faster. Yeah. But there, there are trade-offs, there are costs. But sometimes the cost is different. Because in many cases, people say, oh, it's a cost. But in this case, we believe that in learning, a lot of, many times the cost is not energetic cost. It's not the, the tissue that, you know, it's expensive. But it's really the 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 problem of learning the right things or getting the, the right parameters in order to learn correctly is that you have a huge uh, space of possibilities. And, and the biggest problem is you know how to find the right solution, the right answers. So the cost is in terms of, of knowledge, if you want, rather than costing energy or tissue or stuff like this, or predation or, yeah. yeah. Yes. Do, do these uh, learning processes get relearned if conditions change? That's a good question because um, we kind of discussed a bit. The, one of the problems, but people ask me, what, what do you mean? Is this fine tuning of chunky parameter? Is this a genetic or it's learned? The problem that most of it, we believe that most of it has to be genetic through evolution because it's very difficult to learn during your lifetime. We do believe that there are many uh, phenotypic or flexible rules that adjust the parameter, but it's not, they're not derived by experience, but it's more kind of a, a, a rule of response. For example, we suggest that for in this clear fish, if they lose many clients, okay, it could be that if they experience a lot of disappointment, then there will be a mechanism that increase the chunky parameter, the, the, sorry, reduce the chunky threshold, okay? But it's not, it's, it's an automatic mechanism that evolve in order to adjust it. The problem that when you build a network, okay, uh, it's a developmental process, and the feedback will be very late, the feedback in performance. So relating the, the consequences of, of developmental trajectory to the parameter that build the thing, it's like making decision how big you want to be when you'll be 10, okay? Uh, animals cannot really, you cannot learn it by try and error. It's a long developmental process. So it will be constrained, and we believe that a lot of it will be by, uh, uh, you know, genetic evolution and some you know, typical adjustments, but you cannot really learn it from experience, although I'm open to the possibility that it can happen. Okay. All right, thank you very much. You, uh, you can use it, but...